All right. Hello, fellow songwriters. <clears throat> Ooh. Hello, fellow songwriters, and welcome to season two, episode six of the How Songs Are Made podcast, where we talk to notable artists about their songwriting process. I'm your host, Trey Xavier, and today I'll be talking to Stefan Kumer of Obscura and Tulkandra about how he writes songs. Today's episode is brought to you by my songwriting course, Complete Rock and Metal Songwriting. It's 15 hours of everything that I know about writing songs, everything from writing riffs and transitions to melodies, harmonies, drum parts, vocals, lyrics, and more. And you can find more about that at the link in the description or at howsongsaremade.com. And of course, this episode and all past episodes can be found on all podcast services or at howsongsaremadepodcast.com. And now, the new Tulkandra album, Hail the Abyss, is out now everywhere. Please welcome my guest, Stefan Kumer. Hello there. There's usually an applause button, but um, it's broken right now. So just imagine the applause, the thunderous applause in your mind. <laughs> I'm used to that. <laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah. So how are you doing, dude? Uh, Good to see you. I'm doing fine. It's a lovely Monday evening, 10 p.m. over here in uh, lovely Germany. That means it's raining. It's fucking ice cold out there. We just came home from a little festival run with Tulkandra, and uh, we've been diving into the mud on two festivals. But uh, that's why we are doing it. We love it. We play shows. We party with people. We, well, enjoy and enjoy heavy metal. Hell Lovely yeah. talking to you. Yeah, uh, I think the last time I saw you was on the boat uh, this past year on 70K, which is always a great time can't go wrong playing metal on the high seas it's uh it's funny that it's uh really freezing cold where you're at because it's 90 degrees here fahrenheit uh very hot I've, i'm in the in the air conditioning so it's it's pretty nice um but <laughs> we've got a fire and ice thing going on today <laughs> um so um where in germany do you live i live in the very south of germany close to munich Actually, an hour north, it's a tiny little city called Landshut. Oh. There are not many, not many metal bands coming from this part of the country. Uh, most are based in Munich or around, but uh, it's a very small scene with like four or five bands. But uh, most of them somehow made it uh, to play at least national tours. So it's a lovely tiny That's city. That's good. If you ever make it over. Yeah, I mean, sure. I. I go to Germany a lot. I love Germany. I've been many times. I'll be there. Actually, I'm going, uh, I almost said this month, but tomorrow will be August. I'm going, I'll be there in like two weeks, basically. Um, and I, I haven't specifically heard of your city, but I've been, I've been all over the country. So, and lots of, um, amazing music comes out of Germany. Um, lot, yeah, a lot of, lot of bands that have influenced me a lot. And, um, I uh, speaking of bands from from you, <laughs> I was you know I'd been introduced to Tulkandra recently, and I had assumed that it was a new band that it was like your new your new thing. Um, just because I I don't know I I somehow m missed it, but I was sh shocked to discover that it actually predates Obscura, um, by right like by a, at least a little bit. Um, is that correct? Actually. Uh, actually, Tulkandra was born in 2003, around a year after we founded Obscura. Oh, okay. So, uh, My bad. But it, it happens a lot that a lot of people don't know the band, so we are uh, the most hot newcomer that are <laughs> older than 20 <laughs> been, years. So. Yeah, I've been around <laughs> for a while. Um, nah, well, it's, uh, it's the, different. The it's kind of... It, it's different enough that you've got kind of different audiences, um, because I, I was just very into Obscura, um, and... I, I it was so uh, so such a different sound that I was like oh oh okay now I can see why I'd missed this because it's it's different also also fucking awesome but just super different so yes two different entirely two different projects so both bands are actually rooted in the same in the same soup when we started uh, making music and when we decided with Obscure to uh, uh, to head towards a little bit more demanding, technical, proggy sound. Uh, we somehow still wanted to keep this melodic approach uh, and uh, black metal attitude 
of bands we grew up with from like the mid 90s early 90s mm -hmm. and uh, therefore we just found it basically with obscura members to Kandra in 2003 so oh. same people two different bands and entirely different approaches how to how gotcha. to come up with music how to how to well run a band it's completely different it's completely different but we love it so it's somehow balancing out everything while one of the projects is entirely thought out and uh, planned through like every not, not only the music but also everything around it Vulcandra is uh, not meant to be a touring band it's not meant to be uh, one of those bands you see on every every festival around the world it's uh, it's a different approach we uh, want to keep it a little bit calm and uh, it should be something special if we play a show on the other hand we are still uh, releasing albums regularly we have uh, released five albums so far and there's definitely more to come but uh, the entire approach is a little bit more happening out of a gut feeling so we don't have a real plan we have a, a raw vision how how to come up with the songs how to write an album how to uh, work on the visualized uh, visualized part like all the videos and uh, the layouts the artworks and all that so um it's it's uh, just a little bit it's a little bit different, but on the other hand, uh, we enjoy it. Like all of uh, the members enjoy it playing in both bands, and recently we just played with both bands uh, on the North American one earlier this year, and uh, it was kind of funny because actually both bands are more or less a attracting people from different genres, but on that tour with Flesh God Apocalypse and Wolfheart, uh, it just somehow made the circle complete and it worked so even the black metal fans uh started to cheer up for obscura and vice versa and this is uh really really cool it was one of the nicest tours i did in uh i think the last years so somehow it's uh, very different but at the same time you can enjoy both i think this is a nice bottom line yeah that's great to hear too i mean personally i i listen to lots and lots of different kinds of stuff and i don't really think when i say that i like thought that the two bands were very different like i'm trying to be like a little bit objective or like you know thinking of like from a metal fan perspective we're like no bro it's not technical progressive metal it's tech progressive technical death metal with melodic inf elements or whatever like realistically it's the like you're saying the soup the same soup it's and most metal fans that i know aren't that quite that particular you know um but like it it should be more about bringing people together than the opposite than the than being divisive and um i think it's you've what you've got in there is broad enough that it should be able to bring in lots of people it's um so you've got these two different ways of looking at these two bands the the um the sort of philosophy behind how you're doing it one of them is super planned out and very technical and very precise i guess and then this other one you're kind of it sounds like you're winging it maybe not winging it but just just feeling it out it's not so thinky or something so i imagine that leads to vastly different processes for how you're coming up with the material which brings me to the big question on this podcast there's really only one question and all the other questions are follow-ups and that question is what is the process like for writing the music for both of these bands well that started more than 20 years ago and it's evolved over the years it also changed with uh well, the lineups we had, mm -hmm. for example, if, uh, it doesn't matter which band, but if we had a drummer that is uh, showcasing very, very proggy approaches within his playing, but he's not capable of playing 260 BPM blast beats or something, then I'd rather work on music that is somehow showcasing his strength and on the, uh, on the other part as well. So for me, it always starts with who's playing in the band, what kind of uh, strengths those persons bring in. So this is this is basically the, the start of everything. If I know um, somebody is really, really, for example, the drummers is always, uh, the, the 
drummers are basically the first thing I uh, think about when I'm writing music. And if there is someone with a certain groove, of course, you need to showcase this. You have to uh, somehow somehow also think about the production. If somebody has a really, really fantastic groove, you don't want to edit everything to the max and uh, put everything into into the, the grid because you simply take off all the character of each player. So for me, musicians with an own character are important. And if I see who has which strengths or sometimes also weaknesses, not everybody is capable of everything, myself included. So um, there's there's always the the first idea what you can do. So this is, uh, it's. I'm not talking about boundaries, I talk about uh, opportunities. So what is possible? And then you start, okay, where I am right now, uh, where are we? <laughs> and which year it is. When we started writing music, it was a different time. Um, we started writing music together, but usually it's the guitarist. At, uh, when was that, 2002 or something? Uh, we used uh, four, uh, how do you call it? Uh, Dutch recorders like tape uh -huh. recorders yeah <laughs> so there was no editing possible so you had to write down uh on sheets uh the, the entire arrangement and then record everything in one shot and if you did the, the second part you hated life every time you made a mistake <laughs> because you had to start again so that that took a long time and while the whole gear and uh the technique we've been able to use evolved over the years also the songwriting changed so this is also very important because um the, the music we wrote back 20 years ago is completely different than right now. And there are a couple of game changers that happen along the road. For example, self-recording music. When we started, not everybody had an audio interface at all. That was uh, quite expensive at the time and uh, computers have been quite expensive and uh, not everyone was, was able to use it. There, there have been much more bugs back in the days than now. So. This is one. These days, it's super easy. You just have a plug and play solution, even with a little laptop and a small uh, audio interface. You can plug, play, record, and arrange all of your songs. That wasn't possible back in the days. So, all the songs came up a little bit different from each other. The second big change, I would say, we had, and uh, that was really a big uh, game changer, was the use of Guitar Pro, like writing mm -hmm. down sheet music. This was a big change. So, the first eight, nine, ten years, probably, I think up to up to Cosmogenesis with Obscura, we wrote all the music in the rehearsal room or at home with those uh, tape recorders. Mm -hmm. And when Guitar Pro or PowerTap, also a, it's a different, mm -hmm. um, different program we used back in the days, when this came to our table and we all started to work with it, um, also the music changed and also the way how to how you wrote music. Over the years, we also made our mistakes. There has been written music. Uh, we, we wrote music that the computer was able to play. And we learned the hard lesson <laughs> in the studio and later life. <laughs> it's uh, not ideal. Yeah. So um, it's, it's really hard to say how the entire process starts. If we uh, talk about here and right now, it doesn't matter which band, you have to be in the, in the right mindset and uh, you have a plan ahead of you. So starting writing music for me means I'm not uh, starting with one song for this project or one song for that project, and then maybe I have a couple of riffs in an archive. Um, these days I just work with one album front to end. So if we, for example, decide, okay, we are going to write a new Obscure record, then uh, we start in, let's say, August, that's tomorrow. And we want to be ready uh, by the end of July, uh, by the end of July next year, probably something mm -hmm. like this. So we have one year of uh, writing music and then we do this entire thing in one shot. There's no time for anything else because focus and discipline is uh, quite, quite demanding and uh, something you really need to come up with. And changing your mindset every, every second day is something I really don't like, but that's also something that uh, just came up over the last couple of years. So, um, 
just to focus on a certain project on a certain vibe then pan out your your album do you have a certain idea what you want to what you want to come up with is it a, a certain feeling is it a, a certain pattern you want to show if it's uh, if it's certain certain vocal approaches you want to come up with is it uh, going to be a very angry album is it uh, going to be a more laid back record if you have a couple of points notes laid out before you start writing i think that helps a little bit to, to get orientation yeah it sounds a little bit abstract uh, abstract but um just to give you a little bit of uh, example especially with uh, obscura everything was uh, planned out in not so much in the very beginning but over the years uh, it evolved into what what we are right now so with uh, Retribution, the, the debut album, it was uh, just an uh, orientation record. We didn't know what to do, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't know how to arrange uh, within uh, a DAW program or anything, because we haven't had that at the time. Cosmogenesis was a game changer, because uh, we had a new lineup and everybody put songs together. Most of the songs have mm -hmm. been played live with different lineups before. So uh, you already had this proof that this song is going to work. Mm -hmm. And we didn't overthink too much at the time. It was really quite spontaneous. Everybody brought to the table what he could do best. And that turned out into a, a beautiful record. Mm -hmm. Omnivium. Omnivium was uh, an album that has been written mostly on a backseat while being on tour on Guitar Pro. And not everybody was playing guitar who was writing music. And this turned into a lot of frustration in the studio because, uh, well, if you have to record pieces uh, like note by note, it's not exactly a, not exactly the approach you want to uh, think about when you have to play those songs live. Right. So that was a, a quite dark and angry record. Acrasis, there was a, a quite different, a different approach. Uh, you wanted to come up with uh, some kind of a wall of sound, a more of a, a laid back attitude. Uh, Diluvium shall be uh, rather very, very cold, a cold and dark record because it was part of like a four album uh concept series of albums and uh the last one we recorded was completely spontaneous that was one of the albums we didn't give a fuck and um if you just see this in uh, this entire palette of different records with different attitudes although there's a, a certain coherent like riffing there are a couple of patterns or melodies that are repeating over the years i mean there's a certain sound we came up with within the last 20 years that is, I wouldn't call it signature sound, but uh, you hear the band. If you listen to one song, you there, there's a big chance that you will pick up. Okay, uh, that's that's Obscura, and this also makes a band what it is. So it's on a certain way, it's a core and writing. On the other hand, there are there's enough freedom to come up with something new. With the latest record, A Valediction, we had power metal moments, we had old school death metal moments, and we uh, we just didn't care about any boundaries. Boundaries we thought about uh, when we've been, I don't know, touring for Cosmogenesis, Omnivium, when this big tech death hype was uh, was around there with bands like Necrophages, uh, Decapitated, and all of those bands, like the 2010s, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been a little bit narrow-minded at the time. And these days, we just don't care anymore we just do what we want to do and i think this is what much more healthy this is much more healthy and therefore the entire process to come up with songs also is a little bit easier because if there's a cool idea there's something that fits into this square that is obscura mm -hmm. uh, we just do it we don't overthink it on the on the newest record for example there's a, a lovely song called uh, when stars collide with a uh, clean singing we had uh, bjorn street from soil work uh, being a guest, that could be a, a 80s, uh, 80s power metal song, but uh, somehow we uh, made it happen that it works within, uh, within this obscure sound, and I'm very proud of that. It's really, really, really cool that uh, a song like this works in this entire environment. So now is the big question: How we are going uh, from zero 
to hero to one of those songs <laughs> yeah yeah spare no detail spare no detail so I mean, basically you know, we don't want to be here all day but i want to hear the i want to hear the nitty-gritty that's what we're here for hit me with it, it. basically basically it's the guitarists coming up with songs and uh sometimes there are songs half written and you somehow get stuck at a certain part and then uh you discuss and uh, work with uh, the other guitarist on uh, on certain parts sometimes um you just you just figure okay there's a dead end nothing works <laughs> then you just throw it out of the window that happens as well but uh generally speaking there are two guitarists writing the music and with the drummer and the bassist uh, we work on all the details um, and the arrangements of all records we did in those 20 years, the arrangements are done by the entire band. So for me personally, every album is a collective effort. And everybody everybody brings in what he's doing. Even, for example, even if there's a musician who uh, didn't write the whole song or didn't write uh, music for the album, if somebody else would have recorded this record, it would have sound different. That's my approach. So um coming up with music can be quite fun but the worst thing you are doing is uh discussing about ideas if they're worth um to be uh, used for an album or not if you have 20 songs and you have to pick up 10 for an album uh it's not a fist fight because we are living too far from away from each other <laughs> but uh it's uh, verbally sometimes not ideal but that ha that happens that happens. That's with tough. Tukandra, it's, Choos uh, choosing with between Tukandra, it's completely different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you love all of them. And of course, you want to make sure they are they're getting a roof over their head, but it <laughs> doesn't work any any time. And sometimes a no can be very, very frustrating. Yeah. But that's how it is. With Tukandra, it's completely different. We just uh, don't overthink. Um, we, uh, we write music also with the two guitars and... Uh, shoot ideas back and forth but also it sounds a little bit um uh non-filtered it's uh not too clean for both bands we have full scores of the uh, of the music so with both bands we uh, we uh, work with a guitar pro we have full scores of all instruments of course it, some parts change sometimes even in the studio but uh we come up with full scores with a drum space, all the guitars, all the keyboards and everything. And with those scores, we enter the studio. So the entire songwriting is basically the, the part you have to be finished and you have to discuss even topics you don't want to discuss uh, before you enter the studio. This is also something we, we learned the hard way. If you write songs, they should be finished before you enter the studio. You don't want to start an artistic uh, discussion in, in a recording environment where you basically have to look on the hour and pay the engineer, the studio, the runner and everything. So, yeah, that gets real expensive real fast. Um, so, yeah. so you've got them completely written before you're hitting the studio. And I presume also everybody knows their parts, but have you played them together as a group before you hit the studio? Do you rehearse them? Do you pl play through them or anything? Or do you just? Um, we did that, I think, the last time for Cosmogenesis. That's where okay. uh, most of the songs have been played before with different lineups. But afterwards, we never, we never rehearsed together. And this is actually something I really miss. With Obscura, it's very, very demanding because uh, it takes weeks to just get the, the songs done properly. Yeah. But um, sometimes in a live se uh, session or in, for example, in a rehearsal, you understand, okay, this arrangement may not work that well. <laughs> it sounds yeah. cool in the pre-production. It sounds great uh, on Guitar Pro. But uh, if you play it with the band, <laughs> maybe you should work on that. So over the last two records we did, with both bands, so A Dying Wish and uh, Hail the Abyss with uh, Tukandra and uh, Diluvium as well as uh, Avalidiction with Obscura. 
we worked out entire pre-productions. So songs are written. Uh, we discuss everything with the group, with the guys, and then we make a full pre-production. So that means everything gets recorded ahead. Drums, not, but they are programmed that well that it's almost uh, almost like uh, recorded. So this helps really a lot. This absolutely helps. And uh, with a proper pre-production, you save so much time. And uh, despite the fact that we recorded a valediction during the pandemic with a lot of a lot of setbacks. We were not able to uh, to meet. We had to move uh, the first studio date because we had everything prepared ahead. We had the scores, we had all the pre-productions done, all the lyrics, everything. Everything from front to end was really done. And we just went with the, basically with the whole lines and everything to the studio. Uh, it it was, I would say, one of the most relaxed recordings we, uh, we ever did or in my case, I ever did. That was more easy than the, the first demos we uh, we recorded in two thousand and three. Oh wow! Yeah, well, because you because you, you were just totally ready, completely prepared. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> more more is not possible. I even wrote a, a little studio book. Oh wow! Uh, a show with the time schedules and everything because it was the first time we recorded out of uh, Germany. We flew to Sweden to Studio Fredman, working with uh, Ferry Nordstrom. Oh yeah. And if you don't know how somebody works, like the engineers we worked before over here, they're friends of us. And then you just make silly jokes, and uh, you know it's a little bit different than working with an award-winning uh, producer you meet for the very first time. So you want to, you know, you want to be on time and have everything done and prepared. And <laughs> he shows the book. Uh, up to this date, every band that comes to the to the studios uh, told them this is how it should be done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so basically, we totally overdid it uh, with the preparations, but it it paid off. It really paid off. He was like, he was like, we're doing it like the Germans from here on out. Discipline, discipline, discipline. <laughs> That's a bad cliche, but sometimes cliches are true. <laughs> I mean, um, I think it's. It's true. I've experienced it as being true enough that even like from your perspective, you're probably like, nah, we're not really like that. But from a like laid back American, like, yeah, man, whatever. Like, it's fine. Um, it's it's good. It's a it's not a like it's not a jab because for me, like that level of organizational thinking and not just discipline, but just like having some expectations for things running on time and stuff is like very, very admirable and nice. Um, but yeah, and obviously it worked because you had a much better experience recording, which of course is going to lead to better results if you're not feeling this like, you know, anxious tension, like you're hemorrhaging money because you didn't prepare this thing ahead of time or whatever. So sounds awesome to me like i think that's that's the way to go do you um so let me just catch up a little bit so you've written all you wrote um as the guitar players are writing the songs the um, you're are you also like how um specific are you getting with writing the bass and drum parts like are you do you have like sort of um placeholder stuff that you then let the drummer and bass player go nuts with or is it like this is how it goes and here you go play it like this um both guitarists work with placeholders and of course sometimes there there's a uh, there's a harmonic construction where basically the the bass needs to lead into mm -hmm. but uh everybody can bring in what they can do best so if the basic songs are there uh, the drum lines are changing a lot mm -hmm. because the drummers are writing their own lines basically okay. and uh, afterwards first the guitars then the drums and then usually we work on the bass and then hey hey um the vocal production is a big and very important part mm -hmm. and this is something 
the two guitarists have an uh, entirely different view on. So um, the other guitarist in Obscura at the moment is uh, Christian Münzner. Mm -hmm. And when he writes songs, at least to my understanding, it's very, very guitar oriented. When I write songs, I try to understand um, a little bit the, the whole picture and uh, work with a little bit more freedom so that uh, what I want to say is the guitar doesn't have to be in focus like every time. So sometimes I rather reduce a certain instrument and add more space, for example, choirs for, um, I don't know, a string ensemble or something like this. So the, the approaches are a little bit different, but still the, the results are, are matching up quite well. And uh, it's just fun. I mean, not everybody is the same. And uh, still, if you listen to the whole album from front to end, it sounds coherent. And this is very important. So you also have to uh, sing and play the stuff at the same time. <laughs> so you have to really be considering what you're going to have to play while you're singing this. Like the. <laughs> Christian's like, no, bro, it'll be fine. And you're like, no, I have to. At the same, yeah. that's that's oh, that's too uh, splitting your brain two different ways. I'd be a little be scared to leave to leave something in the hands of somebody uh, who rips that hard. Being like, no, bro, it'll be fine. You can do it. <laughs> be, being there and done that, so uh, that sometimes can be a problem. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, like a big problem because uh, if uh, if you write music that is not made for a four piece, so you have to work with backing tracks. But if the main instruments are not able to be uh, performed live, I think that's not a song you should you should think about performing live at all. And yeah. so there, there's always a back and forth, and sometimes. Um, Sometimes I had to deal with music that is actually instrumental music and then come up with, uh, with um, vocal patterns above it. So basically, uh, sometimes the uh, songwriters are in, in this uh, tech dev scene or they're very demanding prog scene. They forget that there's a singer as well. <laughs> so it's super demanding. Uh, there are a thousand riffs, there are a thousand uh, changes, breaks, but how how you should make this uh work when the where where's the where's the room for vocals where where where's my place yeah <laughs> so uh, this is also a discussion you have every now and then uh back and forth but uh we always found solutions we always found solutions from my perspective most important of a song is uh, a big chorus don't borrow bring us to the chorus yeah That's classic that's how it works. And uh, sometimes I even forced a couple of choruses. So we had a couple of songs in, for example, the Diluvium album. There's one uh, particular song called uh, An Epilogue to Infinity. There is no regular chorus pattern in the entire song because uh, it's a certain theme that is barely repeating anything. But um, to the harmonic structure, you have been able to come up with a chorus. So basically, you have three choruses, chorus parts that are only only the vocals are the same, but everything below is mm -hmm. uh, entirely different riff. But somehow this uh, brings together the entire the entire composition to make it a little bit more di digestible. So with vocal patterns or um, vocal lines. Of course, you can alter the song a lot, even if it's already there and you're you're an addition <laughs> to the entire composition. So uh, you can still form a lot with the boring vocals. And if you're if you bring a little bit more ideas to the table than just cookie monster vocals, that's also the reason why we worked with uh, the vocoders, some clean vocals, and all of that. Just tiny little. Tiny little accidents, um, tiny little colors um, to make the songs a little bit more digestible and more easy. So I think the most boring thing uh, you can imagine is an album that sounds from front to end the same. That's uh, nothing I would listen to a second time. So I want to I wanna see storytelling from my entire album, not only one song, but the entire album. That's uh, the reason we think about arranging the track list 
a lot. You you don't find like ten uh, high speed songs in a row on the on the album. There there's always a, a certain diversity you need to well you you know to um how you call it a certain diversity you have to uh, put into a, an album to make it more interesting. It's uh, always a, a matter of contrasts one song to another. There's always the reason why a ballad is uh, placed after the the most brutal song or vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to hear that about choruses from a, from a tech death perspective because I think the my favorite tech death bands always have killer choruses and memorable good repetition and it's not just through composed nothingness you know what i mean but like and the fact that you worked you cared about it so much that you like imposed a little bit of order onto onto this i mean uh, we'll call it a um an extended composition to to make a chorus happen even when there wasn't really one baked into the format and i think also even the the success of some of these bands like it really i mean obviously i'm a little bit biased the podcast is called how songs are made so i care about the song over the more technical aspects but i love the sound of tech death so when there's a you know when there's a band that brings that stuff both of those things together and isn't just tech or just catchy choruses my brain goes i'm like yeah give me more of that <laughs> and I I think that a lot of my listeners need to hear that. Uh, I've interviewed a bunch of tech death bands on here because I'm fascinated by the pro by the process of how they come up with it. And like a band like Archspire, they're like fucking killing themselves to you know in the you should uh, listen to the story of how they how they write their stuff. It's bonkers. Um, killing themselves to make these songs, um, but they always have like great banger choruses and that's one of the reasons i think that they're one of the bigger bands in the scene they've had immense success for the how crazy their music is you know and same with same with you guys it's um i mean i like many others discovered you through um the the big the big hit song of um uh oh and now it's gone right out of my brain um Oh holy shit! Wow. Oh, we had one uh, more the, memorable song called "The Anti Cosmic Overload." The Anti Cosmic Overload. Thank you. Um, which is like incredibly ripping. I, I I'm so sorry that it, I, like I literally listened to it this morning to, as a refresher because I was like, yeah, I gotta go back because that's where I first found you. Um, and I was like. I remember listening to the beginning and being like, whoa, this is so crazy. And then this incredibly memorable hook, um, super catchy chorus and awesome. And I was like, all right, I'm on board now. So it's nice to hear that you like, you know, to, to hear you say that and to that you that you care about it very passionately, even as you're making this very complex, demanding um, big brain music. It's one of the most important things to have something memorable in your songs. And for me, of course, it's the chorus, but it can be a certain solo section. It can be a certain melody section. You mentioned Anti-Cosmic Overload. That um, was one of the songs we put on a free track demo to send it out back in 2008 uh, to go shopping for certain record labels. We signed up with uh, Relapse Records and they told me it was not the technicality they've been interested in the, because at the time Necrophages was kind of big. Um, it was because you could keep the melody in your head. There was another song called uh, Incarnated. It's not really tech death. It more, sounds more like a Chuck Schuldiner ripoff, <laughs> which might be quite true. But there's a certain uh, tapping melody and uh, this is what stuck in the head of people. It's not the most uh, bizarre phrase you'll come up on your guitar with. It's not uh, the, the weird odd tempos uh, you can show uh, while playing a blast beat on uh, 300 BPM. I mean, if you listen to an entire record and there are a couple of songs or melodies you keep in your head, I think that's more worth than just show off what you can do on your instrument. So... Um, 
a memorable lick sound chorus i think this is upgrading every every and any production these days and it's quite funny that you mentioned anti-cosmic overload uh, up to this day a lot of people just sing along <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> it's they just sing along because it's possible i mean you can even sing along um uh, the melody lines and if we play in uh, southern europe or uh, uh, mexico for example then uh, people just go nuts they can sing along and this is something uh coming out of this this tech death uh soup and this is something not everybody can can show and i'm very very proud of that that uh we are not that narrow-minded than we used to be back in the days that we just do what we want and uh even come up with some cheesy choruses with keyboards <laughs> below that so <laughs> there's always there's always the uh plus one if something goes to 11 this one goes to infinity or something more you is know, always more you know i think i don't think necessarily that the two th ideas are like completely at odds with each other but the excitement of the sort of techier, faster stuff, or not necessarily just faster, but more heady or whatever, more more brainy. And then the the ability to enjoy that at a show and like watch and have your mind blown. Um and then to to kind of bring it back to earth for a minute and to be able to have a sing along where suddenly everybody can participate, you know, is great. Like you're if I'm watching somebody just annihilate their instruments, do something super crazy, even me as like a pretty good guitar player can't do that kind of stuff. So I'm like fascinated watching all of this. I can't participate while while that's going on on stage. I can just sit back in awe. But when it comes time for a I mean, for, really for any lyrical part or or even a melody like that. Now, as an audience member, I can be part of it because I can sing along. Otherwise, I'm just an observer. So you if you I think if you don't bring people in um, in that way, it can be a bit alienating, even even if they really even if they like that. I don't know. A band like Rings of Saturn or something like where it's just. Uh, just fucking wild um basically all the time then it's it's just a completely different experience and i like the the group participation aspect of something like of a chorus or or yeah like you said anything memorable anything that in the moment i go like yes i know this i could be part of it you know like i'll remember that so if i see you play you're gonna see me in the back pumping my fist and singing along and then the rest like the rest of the song i'm gonna be like this <laughs> um the, the nice thing about um choruses like this is you sometimes don't expect they might work why is that so sometimes you, you sometimes you write a, a song you think okay this is the biggest sing along chorus i ever did and then nobody cares about the song <laughs> so uh, we're back at the songwriting um when writing music you have to overthink as well how this is going to be uh how this is going to uh, to work in a live setting is it going to be can you can you well uh, interact with the crowd while playing is it too much on the edge because uh, of course you i mean there are some uh, some parts that are really hard to play and sing at the same time but uh, we, sometimes you just want to play something a little bit easier just to keep some freedom on stage and interact because uh, that's also a very very important part so when writing songs you don't need to write the most demanding shit. It should be a good a good song or in the end, a very good album, in my opinion. And if you somehow bring everything in balance, like uh, rhythm, melody, harmony, and uh, the, the live settings, I think, I think you are already two or three steps ahead to our next uh, very, very good record. Yeah. Um. I think those are incredibly important things to be thinking about. 
sometimes it gets it's easy for it to get lost in the shuffle because there's so many things to think about when you're at any given moment playing or writing music you know you've you gotta play your instrument you gotta get the technical stuff down before you can even consider writing anything at all um <clears throat> no matter how demanding or simple your music is but um so it, I, I think a lot of people get a little bit lost before they even get to that point thinking about memorable parts um thinking about yeah the the overall story of what you're writing but um so let's talk a little bit about um maybe you can give us a little bit more insight into one song maybe something that came together in a in a typical way that you write something but um like walk us through maybe the inspiration and then more specifically where how it how it came together like did it did it start with a riff did it start with a lyric idea um that kind of thing like one one that's notable for you um i would say let me see i think a a nice a nice example would be the title track of uh, the recent obscure record a valediction it's a very very short song below four minutes so that's really short for us and uh it's basically built up like a pop song three choruses the last one of course is a double chorus and what is something we uh, we discovered i think during our second or third album is the additional use of acoustic guitars somewhere in the background so um there are more layers of course there's always the, the the main theme the main song but uh, if you listen through headphones there's always something you can somehow discover and this uh, uh, those layers are basically telling another story of the entire song so for example a valediction was set up as a as an easy pop song but there are so many changes within the single themes there's so much um material so many ideas in this tiny little song if you listen to the one once back to forth you think ah, okay this is fine uh, this is an easy listening song but if you try to perform it if you really sit down and see okay what is going on here <laughs> yeah uh, the, the song has much more to offer and this is something um when i started to play guitar i was a big fan actually i'm still of uh paul marcidel and uh cynic mm -hmm. When they, record, uh, when they brought up uh, Focus back in the day, I thought, okay, this is easy listening. This is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice flow. This is totally awesome. And when I started to uh, um, to play those songs, then I understood, okay, <laughs> there's much more knowledge behind it. This is, uh, this is absolutely interesting. And they basically um, somehow connected the easy listening part with the very demanding music that still attracts the musicians so everybody who is playing an instrument is very pleased and interested but also if you are not playing an instrument if you just want to have a good time at a live show or listen to music with your friends uh, this is totally digestible and this is something i uh, always honor when i'm writing music with this title track a valediction there are many 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 um different ideas for example also changing choruses it sounds like it's the same chorus but it's not um there are a lot of lead guitars there are a lot of uh, seventh string uh like when it, when it comes to the frequent the use of different frequencies of the entire song um there there's a certain wave that is going on from front to end also it's only one main theme that is going on so if you try to play this song just uh note how many variations of the main theme are there basically there's nothing that is going to repeat it also um if you listen to it for the very first time it sounds like it's all the same but it's not so basically there are a lot of easter eggs if you play it with the guitar you will complain a lot <laughs> <laughs> that's probably and, true uh, most of your songs i think uh some yeah <laughs> i heard that before no um 
the use of acoustic guitars, clean guitars, um, extra layers of, for example, the vocoder or clean vocals somewhere in the in the way back. This is this is opening up an entirely different dim uh, dimension. Otherwise, if you just strip it down to two guitars, a bass and drums, it might be able to work. But you underline a chorus with a you know with a second section. You underline um, a guitar solo, for example, with some nice keyboards or choirs that are very sublime somewhere in the background. And there are a lot of lot of tricks and tools. We uh, there's there's actually a certain palette we uh, we all worked through during the last twenty years to come up as a songwriter. Uh, we use every now and then. And if you compare the songs that are coming from the same alley, we talked about the anti cosmic overload. Um, there's also Akrasis, There's uh, a valediction and a couple of other songs. They are similar, but not the same. And this is one one of the uh, I would say a signature sounds we came up with over the years. And this is something I, I would like to keep. Also, um, on every album, we have certain um, certain Easter eggs and traditions. For example, a tradition is to have a uh, instrumental on every album. This is something we went through since the very first demo. And uh, there's always a song with uh, clean vocals. This is something people sometimes forget, and then you read in the in the in the reviews. Oh, they wimped out. They they use clean vocals. Like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. There's a whole website called No Clean Singing. Have you really? heard? Yeah, there's a. It's actually like a pretty popular metal blog. Um, I I think it's like a tongue in cheek kind of a thing. Like they, it's not actually that hardcore, but. I I see that sometimes people are like oh they they use some clean vocals on this one they it's all over for them they're trying to be a Disney metal band now and it's like bro like what it's like one little bit in the whole what you've never like listened to people sing notes before like so it's offensive to you anyway that's very silly um, <laughs> but yeah I mean and on this one you uh, you got Bjorn the fucking king god i lo i love soil work so much and i remember hearing that song and being like wait a second i know that voice it was awesome um it was uh, actually it was a coincidence or like a, a a funny surprise because uh when i flew over to sweden recording vocals uh we always had you know uh, first coffee in the morning uh, discussed a little bit okay which songs we're going to do now we always recorded two songs a day a couple of times but to you know keep it easy for for the vocal strings mm -hmm. we only did two and uh, when i told uh, uh frederick that i would like to try something like uh, bjorn street like in, in this section he just said very dry. If you want to sound like Bjorn Street, we call it Bjorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it, it it was not planned at all. I mean, we had those uh, those vocal lines and everything done, but uh, uh, during the uh, the pre production, so we had a certain uh, a certain amount of notes already. But uh, yeah. within three four days, I remember we had Bjorn Street on the album. <laughs> he's a machine. And, He's awesome. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, also listen to the Night Flight Orchestra, a second oh, band. Yeah. It's fantastic. Great party music. So and, uh, good. What uh, the hell? <laughs> Dude's, dude fucking does soil work. One of my favorite mellow death bands, or not even me really mellow death anymore, which is one of the greatest metal bands, I think, in the history of time. And then he's like, yeah, I guess we'll start another band. And it's fucking Night Flight, and they're amazing. It's like aor classic rock but like better like influenced by all that stuff but somehow better and plus with more like modern production holy shit they just opened for kiss for like really three nights in a row or something. <laughs> yeah i saw him posting about it and i was like son of a bitch yeah you should check them out y'all listening now check out night flight if you if you want to hear like one of the best metal vocalists ever doing like singing not metal really like they're great great songs anyway sorry i sometimes i gush when i'm excited <laughs> but yeah so um just just there he was you were like 
I mean, you're already in Sweden working with a Swedish producer. Like he, he did uh, at least a couple soil work albums, right? Am I crazy? Did they record at least one in there? Ooh, I think they they worked a couple of times together. Yeah. Anyway, but he but, was sure, assuredly knows him, and he's like, "Yeah, let's just call him up, my buddy Bjorn." And uh, <laughs> so I'm very happy this worked out. This is really, really, really nice. Did he and, come uh, down to the studio and do it? No, I think it was about uh, to move to a different place. Oh, okay. Uh, within this week, so he just went somewhere and recorded it. So they've they've been talking in uh, gibberish Swedish <laughs> for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back and forth but uh, they managed it and cool. I'm very happy how it turned out this is really a, uh, first of all a nice surprise because you would never expect his voice on a on an album like ours but uh, I, I love his work not only with soil work as I mentioned also the Night Flight Orchestra and uh, fingers crossed we're going to play some shows together that oh, would yeah. be a, a highlight so he could do the, the vocals live oh that would be super sick um, oh, awesome. So, um, what is like, let's go back to a valediction real quick. I'd like to hear, so I, I love hearing that you built it around a, like one main theme and a lot of variations of it. And it, it's, it's very cohesive and lots of ear candy and all of that. Um, what was the, the first thing, what was the inception of the idea? Was it that th main theme that you came up with? The first was indeed the chorus. Okay. The big ass chorus, but um, not in the in the final um, the final version that uh, ended up on the album. It was a little bit different, but uh, around the chorus, I built the entire song. So okay. um, all the riffs, everything is basically a variation or a, um, a different part of this chorus line. So. Did you come up with the vocal for the chorus and a guitar part with it? Or did you come up with the guitar part and then put the vocal on top of it? Do you remember? Um, I, had the I had the vocal melody in my head. Not not the lyrics. That always comes last. But oh, okay. uh, uh, I had the chorus in my hands and uh, the, the melody to it. And from this starting point, everything else evolved. And... Um, it's very simple. You have that one big idea. And of course, if you're talking about pop songwriting, you have three choruses. The last one is a double chorus. So you need uh, chorus one and two being a little bit, uh, they, they need to differ a little bit. And the double chorus, another another time and in between, you work uh, with those main themes that are, are changing, but summing up and always... Uh, introducing the next chorus so to say yeah do you i so i'm i'm still imagining you working in guitar pro but are you also for like vo are you doing vocal demos in in your daw and stuff as you go as well um as well i do have a vocal cabin over here so uh whenever when i ever have an idea i just uh come up there and I, I work parallel I, um, I record uh, in Cubase and I write down everything in Guitar Pro because uh, sometimes um, working on details is a little bit more easier in, in Guitar Pro mm -hmm. so even if you just have the chords and all that uh, recorded and you uh, transfer everything into Guitar Pro and uh, analyze everything over there and then you can add I don't know for example, the clean guitars, the acoustic guitars and everything. And then back, you will record all the other lines of it. So it's it's always a back and forth. So I try to, to get out both of uh, the, the best of both worlds, so to say. Yeah. I want to keep the spontaneously, uh, the spontaneous uh, riffing. Sometimes you just have an idea. Uh, you would all already forget uh, forget when uh, you type it down in Guitar Pro. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather record it and have it done. And uh, sometimes I have twenty or thirty different ideas for the same song, just recorded uh, to a click track, and then arrange everything. And then I have this this raw idea of a song, and then I type it in into a Guitar Pro, and then I start arranging it. So it's always a back 
back and forth. And once the song is done, I have a raw arrangement. To be honest, I also work a lot with colors. So all parts in my DIV are uh, colored because always the chorus is always green, the color of hope. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow. The solo is always red because I hate myself. <laughs> Hope and, uh, hope and anger back and forth. Self, uh, self but Hope and self-loathing. There's a title for <laughs> the next one. But but this really helps to, to get an overview. And uh, once the, the, final, the final song is uh, written into Guitar Pro, everything is done, the whole score is there. I go back, record basically the, the clean recording of all the guitars, and then I send this with my placeholders to the band. But I also learned a hard lesson. Um, if you don't record vocals and all the the details, like the the chorus, uh, not the chorus, uh, the the choirs, uh, the effects, and everything, the bandmates don't understand what you have in your head mm -hmm. if it's not on the demo. Yeah. And then sometimes parts are a little bit too empty. So mm -hmm. we also had a couple of discussions. Oh, it's too boring. Now we need to add something. Yeah, just wait, guys. <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> Trust me. And uh, so for the next album, uh, we do even more pre-production on the demos before we start working on the arrangement with the band. So even if it's just tiny, tiny little details we're talking about, um, every album production differs from, from the other. Not only album production, also songwriting session. It's always a little bit different and you're always, you're always, uh, try to do the best and uh, see how how it comes up yeah it's hard it's hard when you've got such a strong vision for something and you're hearing not just like additional parts and stuff but um also the possibilities of what they could be and you but you want to collaborate you want like you want to hear somebody else's take on it and then they're like well, I don't know, bro. Like, it feels like I need, and then you then you remember they can't hear inside of your brain. <laughs> um, but it's that's that's the one of the give and take bits of working with other people. You know, you could just do everything exactly how you want it by yourself and just hand it off to them and be like, you're just gonna do it exactly like this. But. Um, it's it's also much more fun to work with other people and it can be really um uh, much more inspiring um and on that note do you um do you ever have something like are you ever in so inspired by your bandmates to make something that like would like some completely different completely change the course of the song from what it was or something like a somebody comes up with a, a drum part or a bass part and you're like oh we got to go back and we need more of that uh that also happened that also happened i wrote a couple of songs with no blast beats at all absolutely no heresy blast beats. So it had a heresy yeah <laughs> so it had an entirely different uh pace vibe the entire song it was more laid back and then somebody came up and said Wait a second. <laughs> and uh, the song made a twist. So um, every time you work with the group, even if you present a whole song, the songs are, are formed by everyone. And uh, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's not too different. Sometimes uh, a song gets an entirely different structure. The opening track of... Uh, a valediction forsaken for example it was a 10 minute long song with uh i think a thousand different parts more and i think that was one of the songs we uh, rearranged by far the most and in the end everybody was happy so it's all about communication if you are putting on the table ideas you have to accept the no you have to well of course also fight for your for your ideas but in the end, if you if you find a way to finish the song, that's not a full compromise where everybody is not happy, but wherever everybody can say, okay, I put everything in, I I'm happy with. This is a this is a song I'm really proud of. Then they made everything right. It doesn't happen every time, to be honest, 
but when it happens, like this composition, uh, it turned out to be something special. So you mentioned working with Frederick Nordstrom on this one. Um, does the producer that you're working with ever have input on the songwriting itself? Or has have they in the past when you've worked with other producers? Mm, I think on Omnivium, uh, we had to rearrange with the producer in the studio a lot. Simply because we went into the studio uh, with only guitar profiles. We started in the studio mm -hmm. to play the wrist for the very first time, which was a big mistake, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, I mean, you, you learn the hard way sometimes. The, the album turned out okay. The album is uh, is fine, but uh, in the studio, uh, we started to to rearrange songs. We started to cut out parts. We started to well work on the songs while recording. And uh, I think this is the only album where the studio producer really had a lot of impact on the other songs. Uh, on the other songs on the other albums. Uh, I think especially within the vocals, uh, it was always a uh, back and forth with the producer. So you come to the studio with uh, certain ideas or uh, later later albums, uh, pre-productions, but then working together on uh, on choirs and, and all that stuff. I think that is, that is an influence from a producer, of course, because uh, vocals are basically the first instrument that you have in your head, usually mm -hmm. by nature. So... When it comes to anything else, I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, of course, if you're recording your instrument, for example, the bass or the drums, uh, there, there's always some feedback. Oh, maybe you could do a, a different a different role. Maybe you could do a different drum uh, introduction, uh, drum part or something like this. Or, hey, maybe you do a different slide or the bass. But uh, the whole songs have been done every time, except... Uh, for this one album so with freddie nordstrom it was i think just recording just recording and of course the the stunt with uh, uh bjorn that was kind of fun and we worked a little bit on uh, on the levels and how we arranged in the panorama mm -hmm. the different the different parts uh, we had a couple of songs where many 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 different uh different instrument lines have been stuck together, but uh, you can double everything and put everything left and right, which is a little bit tiring, or you play around it, because sometimes the, the main melody comes from the right side, the naked time or from the left side, and uh, then you have a harmony or something with both uh, at the double chorus. Something like this, of course, this is uh, part of the mixing, producing mixing in my opinion, but every production starts with the songs. It's part of the storytelling too. Where it sits mm -hmm. in the, where things sit in the stereo field, can change a lot of what's going on. Which is why the the studio mm -hmm. slash mix production aspect is uh, a, almost like another instrument in a, in a sense. Um, I've heard people say that a lot before, but the way that I look at it is like. Um, like on a set for a movie, you know, you're lighting certain things a certain way. And like the mix engineer's job is to like light certain things to bring them to the foreground to highlight them or obscure them. You know, some things should be at certain times up front and some things should be in the back. And that's a whole, that's a whole other can of worms. Like you're sitting there writing the song. You get, you've heard it a million times in your head a certain way in your pre-production and demos and all that. And then all of a sudden, there it is in crispy HD coming out of big ass speakers. And you're like, oh shit, this thing I thought was going to sound a certain way, sound good, is not working at all. And that's you're, then you're relying on, the, on, this, on the, the knob twister guys to be like, oh, don't worry, I'll just whee, pan that over here, pan this over there. And all of a sudden, it makes sense. Um, that this is a okay. very. Excuse me? No, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I mean, every, every production starts with the songs. And um, if you have a certain 
a certain idea of how your album is going to sound, you should also think about the music you are uh, delivering to. If you play, I don't know, odd times on uh, 250 BPM and uh, a thousand blue notes, ghost notes on, on drums, you're not going to uh, look into a very, very uh, characteristic and open and living production. It's going to be cold and uh, very produced because otherwise you can't hear all the details. On the other hand, if it's if the music is a little bit easier, you have much more room for much more work on the on the production end. So, with uh, for example, Freddie Nordstrom, I was always very impressed. Not about the we talked about the panorama, but uh, how he places all the instruments in depth. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how how to explain that in uh, in English. I, I don't have to. No, that makes sense. In English. Yeah, the the uh, yeah depth. That makes the sense. depth. So uh, if you listen to uh, the album with headphones, uh, you have the drums over here. You have the vocals and straight in your head. You have uh, the bass in the center, but a little bit before the drums. And uh, you have all the guitars. You have the additional guitars. Uh, then you have the, the choirs a little bit in, but a little bit on the back. So it's basically a 3D mixing. And this is something I'm very, very interested in. And tr I try to write music for this production as well. That's what we did with uh, the album Akrasis, for example. And uh, we worked with so many different instruments, so many different uh, like weird ideas and uh, also world music influences. And uh, we tried to place it everywhere to get this uh, wall of sound idea and uh that was very 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 demanding but uh i i liked the the outcome of the entire record so depending on the music you're able to uh to produce a certain album and then come up with a certain production with audio production that uh, is as you said uh storytelling from front to end and this is a big can of worms you never end i could mix an album for i think two years in a row and <laughs> wouldn't be happy. So uh, it's better somebody else is doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I always leave that to the, to the pros. And then, and then you, you get to ask for things like you can kind of nitpick, but you don't actually have to do them. You can be like, mm, I want this to sound a little more squishy and I want like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they have to be like, uh, okay. And figure out what that means and then make it happen. But like you're saying, like the, like depth like i understand all the very basic mixing ideas and concepts like i could be like oh this sounds like it has too much high end in it this is flubby or whatever but i don't know how to create depth in a mix i have no that is wizard magic to me so you just you just leave because there's so many so, only so many hours in a day <laughs> you're, you're you're here trying to like create tech death magic and, like write it in Guitar Pro and make demos and <laughs> tell a story and all this stuff. Let the let the uh, like outsource that shit to somebody who's really good at it. But um, <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? Oh, I had a really good one and I lost it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, storytelling and um, mixing. Uh, have you have you listened to anything in uh, in atmos or like spatial audio or anything like that where it's so separated out with like the um like surround sound style thing do you know what i'm talking about um i don't know any rock music or metal music that's been mixed there's not a lot this. no i i don't know any any of those albums but i did uh listen to a, stuff like this and i also worked in this field for some time oh wow so the yeah long time ago so um it was i a... used to uh sorry yeah go ahead uh i used to work uh for yeah some time in the uh, university as a, a as a lab engineer for audio production building up studios and uh for a glimpse of time i worked in the audio department for bmw and rolls royce oh wow and uh i was working with vibra acoustics stuff like this but uh that was not my world so i i quit it and uh went towards the heroic 
uh, Rockstar Dream. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, working in Guitar Pro and uh, working on Cubase. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, I only I only thought of it because of the uh, the depth factor. I mean, it's I I, I experienced it once. I went to like a uh, the Sweetwater Studio has this uh, has a whole room dedicated to Atmos, and I never experienced it before, and it was. It's really wild. It's really very wild. I don't know like I don't know if I would want to listen to music like that most of the time. But like you were saying, there's not a lot of rock and metal music that has been mixed like this so far because I think you you have to approach it completely differently. Like you can't just double track the guitars and be good because there's like four, you know, you, you're thinking two and two like you'd have to at least quad track to get the same basic like feeling uh like to have it feel full the way that it was stereo you know you if you double track rhythm guitars and hard pan them right and left you get that sound you get that big full metal heavy sound like stereo sound but like all of a sudden if it's just that and you're trying to mix it in atmos it sounds really empty and weird other kind, other styles of music don't really have that problem because they've, you can like, the layers are just, it's not that important. It's it's a different style of layering, but it's uh, oh boy, it was a hell of a rabbit hole. Is uh all I'm saying about that. Anyway, I'm ranting a little bit. I'm um I'm curious at this point. Um, I ask people this sometimes, and. It's always it's always really different from pretty much everyone I've asked. How do you know when the song is done? I think the song is done when I don't find any idea to make it better. Okay. That can be anything. Sometimes a song is done within half a day in a nice afternoon. It just works like nothing and sometimes you work on the same composition for months and uh, months and months and months it's uh, something unpredictable it's really unpredictable but the the thing is done and ready when uh, all band members contributed their ideas and we're done if it's going to be a good song or a bad song in the very end this is something you decide later <laughs> do you have any specific philosophies about the arrangements of your songs like the the song structures obviously all of your songs have different structures but is there anything that's like really consistent in terms of how you how you're thinking about it and approaching it when i write songs i would say the choruses are the most important anytime Big choruses. I I'd rather have a, a big ass chorus than a, a guitar solo in a song. And I'm a guitar player, so <laughs> this is important. Um, you love to hear it. I love hearing that. <laughs> as much as I love guitar solos, and I do. I love to be entertained as a listener, and I'm still that much of a fan of this kind of music that I listen to. A, all kinds of new music, all kinds of uh, CDs, vinyls that are put out that I still have this enthusiasm to uh, to find something new. And when, when I come up with uh, another song, I would like to uh, trans, trans, uh, come over with basically the same, the same feeling. And a song is basically a song when, uh, well, when you don't bore anyone and uh, you have something to tell yourself, but also the audience in a live setting. That's also a very important factor. When you feel like you've gotten to a point like that with a song where you're, you're pretty happy with it, it's feeling done, do you ever show it to people outside of the band or anything and get any kind of feedback? Do you have like a test audience or something like friends family no no i don't show it to anyone absolutely not no they 
I'd rather send the, the full album when it's done. The same with the record labels. For example, with uh, Obscura, we just asked them if they want to listen to uh, the demos or the pre-production before. Just, no, just go for it. <laughs> that is a high level of trust. Yeah, that's cool. With uh, 200, it's different. Uh, they ask every time for uh, the full pre-production. Or at least minimum so and so many songs. So it's completely different, a different approach. But wow. those people are the only ones who would hear a full pre-production ahead of time. No one else. Because even if you and me would understand uh, what a pre-production is, if, uh, I don't know, a pre-production of a, of a song goes public and people or our fans would see it as a, as a whole new song, as uh, as a new release but it's not produced it's not finished then uh well you shoot your in your own food yeah um when the you're saying the label wants to hear basically they want to hear a rough version of the songs before um before you actually go in and record them what is it that they're looking for like what do they want to know and do they ever send you feedback do they go like can't put this on there or we need something that's a more of a single or whatever i never heard something like this yet but uh you never know <laughs> yeah i mean we are, we are not a pop act so by far not yet <laughs> not yet but what yeah what are they like what kind of response do you usually get from the label when you send it in i think the last couple of times they just said oh yeah, cool that's it <laughs> so it's not a real response but we we delivered we delivered it and uh just got uh okay okay enjoy so, so you've never so gotten, i'm not sure yeah you've never gotten any like notes no okay no. man at a certain point sometimes, it's like sometimes you head into full the full record and then uh, a year later uh, you get a mail oh by the way the album's cool <laughs> Thanks for sending. I think somebody at the label just wants to hear it before everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I mean, you want this. Um, you want the label to be your biggest fans, but uh, that feels over the top. But yeah. Um, okay. So it's it's basically limited to the four of you at any given moment. Like nobody hears it outside of the band until it's. Until it's until you go in and record it, and then it's just the engineer, and then not even the label, except for uh, the Tulkandra one, like is privy to what's got what's coming. It's a big old surprise for anyone who isn't the four people in the band, is what you're saying, right? Yeah, exactly. I I don't see the point of showing anyone demos of half finished ideas. Yeah, I mean that's that's. Uh more like a begging for compliments thing <laughs> not 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 my not my attitude i'd yeah. rather finish it have it done and then then you can decide if it sucks or not yeah i think i, I mean i ask a lot of people this and some people have like a trusted circle of people who will give them very honest feedback and not just say nice things and be like i don't know man this one kind of sucks uh, <laughs> um, just to get some objective feedback, but that don't, that's not everybody needs that or, or wants it. Um, and you know, like you, what I think comes out of not getting that is a vi is a much more pure artistic statement sometimes um, because it's, it's not, you don't have anybody else's critical voice in your head. You don't go like, Oh man, Steve said, this sounds just like the last album we put out or whatever. Um, and that can be awesome. Um, it's, it's just, a, it's just one way of going about it. Um, do you, okay, here's one. Do you feel like people are picking up what you're putting down? Like when you do that, and you get you've created this album, this statement that's very pu purely from the four of you. 
do you usually think the people who are listening to it get what you were going for? That's a very good question, because how I should know. I think most of the, the users, for example, of social media channels are reading a lot, but not participating in any uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. So usually rather critical or negative people uh, are the loudest. Mm -hmm. So if you look into any kind of feedback within comments, it's not very healthy. And therefore, you don't know how many people are listening to the music, uh, watching the videos, uh, reading the lyrics, and understand what you're trying to say, because there's no, absolutely no feedback. Sometimes we get a letter from, uh, from a fan, sometimes uh, you talk after live shows with people. Uh, I think this is the, the only feedback, the only honest feedback you get and everything else is totally up to to the fans and they decide if they if they like what they hear see and read or not if they understand everything i don't know some parts for example the lyrics are very very abstract very very closed in a certain way i'm not sure if you understand everything but you don't have to i mean you uh, it's enough if you just read through it if you listen to the music if uh, there's one melody line you you keep and like and i don't know maybe show one of your friends at a later point if you if you interpret uh, certain lyrics in a in a positive way for yourself this is this is all cool it's just nice to be heard and seen and listened to i agree it's uh it is it, it is nice and i i think i always want people to always get what i'm trying to give them you know like the i want the intent of what i'm making to be heard but that's also like kind of the hardest part you know, to get people to to understand what you're trying to say to connect with them but um it's i think you're right i i didn't really think about that when i when i've been asking that question is like how do you get that feedback um like where mm -hmm. do you even get it from like you'd have to either specifically ask for it or really go digging um and yeah there's um yeah so um um all right yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna have to uh, think on how I structure that question from now on because that's a good that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I guess it, to a certain extent you are sort of guessing or like kind of looking at the overall cloudier version of like oh are a lot of people downloading it, streaming it, watching the videos, whatever. You don't know like oh I meant this lyric to be a certain thing and somebody actually said like oh I love this lyric and how it said this or whatever. Um, but that actually uh, brings up a, another question. The lyrical content of your songs when you're writing, um, do you have a certain way that you go about it? Do you? Is there anything in particular that inspires you to write certain lyrics a certain way? Or do you have a... Yeah, do you have a real specific intent when you're writing? Like, are you telling very specific stories or is it big broader than that? Or what's your approach? Mm, that depends from album to album. So we just finished a, a four album cycle where four records have been connected on a lyrical basis. So that was set in stone. What, what's it all about? On the recent record, it was a little bit more open, so that also gives a little bit more freedom. But uh, as you can hear, I'm not a native speaker, so uh, my English approach is still, uh, well, I'm still working on that. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if uh, if everything can be understood. I'm I'm writing. I'm trying and uh, it always depends on the whole album concept. So a valediction, I mean, the, the, the album title explains a lot 
it's a it's a farewell record and therefore i had uh, 11 11 ideas that are somehow connected to that and this is something i think about before starting writing so i mean we talked about the production the live shows uh how you build it up um the, the lyrical content also the visual content this is all something i i think about before i'm starting to write music so I need a certain mindset, and for the mindset, I'm I'm writing down a couple of a couple of notes. I always have uh, a couple of files with me where I put in ideas, even on the road or I don't know in the underground somewhere, and uh, it should be somehow building up to a big, understandable big picture. Like each album should be able to stand on its own, but at the same time, it should be uh, a round product. So you should be able to listen to it from front to end without getting bored. Everything should be high quality. The, the music videos should be on the same level as the music and the lyrics. Same with uh, the haptic part, like the, um, the materials you're using to print vinyl, uh, CDs and all that. Everything should be as, as good as possible. And with the lyrical content, this all is connected somehow. It's, it's sometimes it's a it's a it's a hen and egg principle. You don't know what is first, but uh, the the more notes you put together, uh, the more clear this picture gets uh, in which direction this album is going to. So you you build up the lore, the the setting first. Is kind of, sounds like what you're saying. You're you're creating a, a bit of a a world to write these stories in. Like it all because it has to follow it ha everything has to fit together and and work together then you're you're not just going in like i was mad yesterday because i stubbed my toe so i'm going to write a song about that it's not just whatever you're feeling like it's this it's this much bigger thing that everything is fitting into mm -hmm. um so then i guess um hmm how do i ask this without making you explain the entirety of of it maybe you could give us like a little bit of a tldr on that four album idea uh and then maybe um because i would like to hear what maybe one or one bit of a song that, a lyric that you wrote what it means like what you were going for and where it fits within that. So yeah, maybe, maybe give it, give me the short version as much as possible for the, the big picture. And then give me like something that fits in there and why you did it like that. If you can think of a good example. Hmm. So the four album concept was uh, actually bound to the fact that we uh, signed a record deal that was uh, uh, four albums long. So that was the whole idea. So I thought, hmm, okay, how how we should uh, bring up this a little bit more cool. So I thought, okay, for album concept, maybe something like Led Zeppelin did back then. Okay, so we had the four albums, and uh, it's basically a evolution circle: uh, birth, evolution, consciousness, apocalypse. So that's the four the four records. It's very short. And uh, like after the apocalypse, you know, rebirth starts again. So you can listen to all the four albums in a row. This was the whole idea. Bound to that are all the the colors. Like you always had uh, the opposites: red, blue, yellow, green. Also the um, the album titles like Omnivium, Diluvium. They are connected. Uh, Cosmogenesis, Akras is just with the endings of the world. So the the words. So. This all is, uh, it, it started with Cosmogenesis when, yeah, when we had this idea of a four album circle and then it built up piece by piece. So we had more or less like a guideline that helped to, you know, establish the band, establish uh, a certain a certain way to write lyrics as well. Because as a, as a teenager, you're not that secure even if you're not a, a native speaker, how to how to come up with uh, 
lyrics. So I just started to write about things I was interested at the time. And therefore, it just took 10 years, but we finished it. <laughs> I mean, that's a hell of a but, commitment to make that early on. Yeah, I mean, we had some uh, good times and also very bad times where we didn't know if the band will exist any longer, but uh, we still had to make two albums, so <laughs> to finish the circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I think this might make it a little bit easier for you to narrow it down. Do you think you could tell us what you think is the most significant lyric in the story maybe the thing that you feel like ties it all together like the mm. the moment that that you were that you were like this is the end of the story or whatever i think there's not such a such a no. a line in the entire thing because it's a it's a four album row where there's not one record more um important than the other okay so they're all basically the same line and uh, there's not this single uh, this single phrase or this single uh, bar i would say this is the most important okay maybe just something something significant a good example or your favorite even i think i don't have any favorite <laughs> tell me one line from yeah. any one of your songs anyone yeah any Anything, maybe something that um, you think is worth explaining, like something that you're like, that maybe something you're proud of. I think Ode to the Sun from the Acra Isis album is, uh, is a nice example. It's a very, very slow song. It has something morbid, morbid angelish ish mm -hmm. uh, but combined with uh, being a love song. So basically, the entire the, the entire song is a love song towards uh, the light bringer. This is the, the whole album across is working with that uh, the light bringer. So basically, I inverted um, everything that has to do with uh, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. The light bringer usually is the you know the saint, the the one that brings love and peace and everything. But in this occasion, the the light bringer is uh the end of all ends the the ultimate big bang so uh, inverting things is uh quite quite normal in uh, norway <laughs> but in this case it's uh, it's it's a big critic on uh well christianity overall but packed into a, a into a very abstract uh piece so i think just um, Ode to the Sun thing is basically a love song towards God, which is also turned out to be a, a, a woman who brings death and peace to everyone. I'm, cool. I'm quite proud of it. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, also, ser sermon, uh, sermon of the Seven Sons, uh, the opening track of that record. There are also some really dark, dark lines. Can you... And there Sorry? Can you give us like some like actual examples of the lines and that you like and what you like about them? Hmm. It's not one single line. It's really hard to just put it together. I mean, everything is uh, leading towards the choruses of both songs, but uh, it's not that one line. Gotcha. Okay. Um. Do you have a specific feeling that you're trying to evoke in the uh, in the listener when you're writing some of these? Like, do you do you feel like um, you you're able to set a a tone with the lyrics? Like, are you trying to make them feel people feel a certain thing? I'm trying that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes absolutely not. So that always depends on who is who is listening to the song and reading the lyrics. A couple of also the, the, the more recent records, the songs are, they have a rather melancholic pace. They're a little bit more fragile than it might be. Um, 
then you might understand it in the very first place because you, you have this uh, tech death brutal death metal with growling vocal uh, piece and then you read the lyrics and say hey moment <laughs> <laughs> this is uh this is a little bit weird but uh if you put a little bit thought into it i think uh you 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 get it you get the pace you get the the, the vibe i would like to uh, transpose so to say for example a, a valediction is one of those pieces that's uh that's some kind of a bittersweet attitude um when stars collide the song we talked about with Bjorn street on vocals is actually a very very sad uh sad part of lyrics you have i like to, to work with oppo uh, opposites for mm -hmm. example you have this almost like a party uh, AOR influenced Brian Street song. Um, and then you have lyrics that, uh, yeah, that are actually quite sad. And this is something I, I, I love to combine. So the, the, the opposites that are actually, they shouldn't be used to be uh, in one song, but somehow it works quite well. It's... So I, I like this uh, bittersweet kind of melancholic part in the lyrics a lot. And this is something I am able to showcase a little bit more during the last years because in, well, uh, because in the first couple of years, I, I was first of all bound to uh, the conceptual records. And second, uh, I didn't know how to express this in a foreign language. Yeah, I mean, that's... It's, it's tough. Your English is very good now. I, um, I mean, I don't know what it was like or, earlier, um, but being having a very, I would say, uh, maybe like a third grade level German <laughs> uh, language skill, um, ba maybe barely, which is hilarious because I've been going to Germany for more than twenty years. Um, but love German. Um, are, are you? generally thinking of the ideas in um like are you originating the lyrics in english or are you thinking of concepts in german and then translating them or are you at the point where you're actually generating the ideas in english um the last one it's um i write everything down in english straight ahead okay sometimes for um certain certain words i look up Mm -hmm. um i look up to some dictionaries but um, usually it just comes up straight ahead okay um the explanation that i've gotten from a lot of my german friends as to why like it, it seems to be changing now but for a long time there were a lot of other european countries were much better at english than G germany and all my german friends are like well, all of our goddamn movies from American movies and stuff that are in English are all overdubbed. We can't get the subtitles. Um, and uh, I've heard that like the overdub thing in Germany is like a huge deal. Like the overdub, um, the voiceover actors are like, they like have a specific guy who does Bruce Willis. You, you can like, you oh. know, confirm or deny, but that's what I've heard. Um, and yeah, that's... That's absolutely true. And uh, it's super weird if you hear the original actors. <laughs> like if you watch Die Hard uh, in English for the first time, it's like, eh, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, that is a historical, um, a historical reason because uh, the, the market in Germany or France is so big because we have over here like 80 and in France like around 70 million people living. It makes sense to have those overdubs, like all the Scandinavian countries, um, they speak excellent English because uh, they only have subtitles in Swedish, Norwegian and uh, Danish. So they have excellent English and uh, learn the language way easier than we do. Yeah, but we have Bruce Willis in German. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it was funny. Uh, when I learned that, I was like, Oh my God! So you guys like you don't know what Brad Pitt sounds like. You don't know what Brad Pitt's voice sounds like because I, I remember watching uh, the first time I was there. I like just flipped through the TV and I saw The Simpsons mm -hmm. in with with like the overdubs, and I was like, 
this isn't funny. <laughs> like the most of the jokes are that they, they they have these specific voices and it's funny. Anyway, sorry, I'm going down a total rabbit hole here. But um, so like I think I'm f- first of all, it's in- incredibly impressive to me that anybody can even speak two languages fluently. And your English is, is very good. Um and the fact that you're able to write, I've never had to write a song in another language, so I wouldn't even know how to go about it. So you're writing in your second language and you're able to express yourself very well. Um, I guess, um, have you have you ever considered writing uh, in German just to be able to express yourself even more clearly since it's already your first language? Mm, I thought about this a couple of times. We had one German title an Akrasis record called uh, Weltseele, but uh, I I don't see the necessity to to work out anything in German. First of all, I think the the language of uh, rock and heavy metal is simply English. It would mm-hmm. sound a little bit weird. Rammstein is a d- completely different different <laughs> universe. Yeah, but I I doubt it would work for us. I doubt it would work for us. Uh, Maybe in 10 years we talk again and uh, I change my mind, but right now I do not have the intention to write anything in, in German. Yeah. Have you done that before? Have you written lyrics in German? No. No? Never. Interesting. So you, yeah, so you've written all of your, all of your lyrics in a second language. Goddamn, dude. Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> that's of all the technical feats that you've pulled off in your music te- in your tech death music the hidden layer of this is the technicality of you writing in your second language nobody knew it oh, nobody geez. even thought about it until just now this motherfucker is technical as fuck doing my best living the dream <laughs> um so i feel like we went um pretty far down the obscura rabbit hole um i want to um let's see ah okay since we're talking about lyrics can you uh contrast the lyrical themes of tool chandra with obscura like what do you do differently when you're writing for tool chandra well while obscura is working with those big con Sapts, uh, I explained, uh, Tulkandra is much more coming out of a gut feeling. So there is not a real concept. I mean, there, there's a certain, um, to a certain degree, we have uh, topics we, uh, we can work with, whatever is dark, whatever is uh, uh, bizarre and mean, but uh, it's not a real concept of anything. We had some some topics that are coming uh, back every now and then. We uh, we lost our bassist a couple of years ago, and therefore that that one album that, that followed afterwards was dealing a lot with uh, yeah death and uh, people leaving too early. And I think on the last record there are one or two songs that are dealing with uh, with this topic, but everything else is uh, much more loose. This also helps to keep it a little bit more spontaneously. Uh, how to write music, how to write uh, lyrics, and everything. So w- I love it absolutely the the same way. Both both bands, both ways to work, but uh, at the same time, it balances you a little bit out if you write just what what you think from your brain on the table, and sometimes uh, you think a little bit more about it before so that and this really helps a lot with the the most recent record of uh, Tukandra Hail the Abyss it's exactly the same so we didn't overthink too much sometimes the the song dictates the vibe of the lyrics if there's a for example a, a very fast driven hyper speed or up tempo song it's not going to be a ballad it's absolutely yeah. not going to be a ballad, but uh, the lyrics have to somehow uh, work with the, the the music. So it's more spontaneous, way more. Okay. Um, oh, excuse me. What's um, maybe tell us about one song on the album and what it's about lyrically. 
Mm. Or the yeah, generally. Yeah. Even uh, the final cl the final closer, for example, this mm -hmm. is uh, the last song. It's an eight minute piece built on I think eight guitars. It's a very 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 slow song. So the intention of the song was to write music that is even slower when it comes to tempos than anything we did before. And therefore, also the lyrics had to be very, very, very happy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the opposite of happy. <laughs> <laughs> very <laughs> heavy, very heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, and touches your guts, so to say. And yeah. uh, th this song deals also with uh, losing people a little bit too early. Mm -hmm. And uh, about seeing them on the other side a little bit later again. Okay. It's a good one. It's a, it's a very... Very nice song. Eight minutes, but uh, they pass by quite quickly. Oh, yeah, that's what you want. Especially it, long and slow is very hard to keep people's attention. You got to you got to really want it <laughs> if you're going to if you're going to go that route. But it's um, it can also be incredibly satisfying. Sometimes a, a like a long, slow build with a big payoff. I always think of uh, Dark Crystal. Have you seen the, the movie Dark Crystal? the jim uh -huh. henson like uh it's you know they're like jim henson puppets uh but it's super dark um and there's this for a lot of the movie these puppet creatures are just like crawling across the desert incredibly slowly and like there it's it almost feels torturous at times you're like jesus i just want to go and like i want to give them some rascal scooters so that they can, this movie can go faster but by the time they get there you're like yes <laughs> and it's it's worth the payoff so um it's uh it can, yeah that's awesome uh yeah going making it feel not long and and slow is that's a task um wow okay um i guess is there anything that you think is worth telling songwriters up and coming people playing metal or not like any kind of advice that you think is very important for people who are listening to this, who are mostly going to be interested in songwriting more than anything else, but also metal. Mm, there's only one advice just, don't be that narrow-minded and just enjoy the time you have with your friends writing music together. And don't try to force your ideas through anything mm, because okay. this will cause more tensions than, uh, than it will pay off in the very end. That's what I learned over all the years. Okay. So I'd rather enjoy, make music together. If uh, that one song is not your favorite, fuck it. Maybe it's the second. And you put together an, a nice album. All right. So, um, so you don't, you don't want to like die on these hills of a uh, certain, you know, you don't, don't let it get to, don't let it come to blows over, over songs. Just have fun writing songs with your friends. Yeah. Just go for it and then you will enjoy much more. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you. That's, um. I think this is a, a pretty good place to to wrap it up. Um, I love doing these. I always tell every guest that I do these more for me than anything else because I just love hearing about how people go about it, um, how people take an idea th through, to, oop, through to completion. And so thank you for sharing all of this with me and with us. Um, and what do you... Uh, what do you want to tell the tell the people about what you've got going on with both bands? Well, we have a couple of uh, of tours leading up, and they will be announced very soon in Europe, in South America, in the uh, United States, as well as in Canada. So it's uh, going to be a quite busy year, and uh, of course, we are working on on new music for for both bands. So it's not going to be boring. There's always something to do, and we can't wait to see all of you again. Yeah, um, I will uh, hopefully be able to come out and see you this time when you're when you're in LA. I missed the last one, but um, 
it'll be it'll be awesome if I can come out this time. So um, I'll take a look and see when that's when those get announced and when they're coming along. And uh, of course, the new uh, Tool Conjure album, Hail the Abyss, is out now everywhere. Um, and uh, so go go and stream it. And now that you've heard a lot about how all of this came to be, you can uh, you can hear it with fresh ears. Um, on all streaming services and all of that. Stefan, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Likewise. Thank you very much and hope to catch up in uh, later. All right. Can't wait, dude. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right. All right, guys. Thank you all for listening. Um, I had a great time talking to Stefan. The... uh, you know, big uh, been a big Obscura fan for a long time. Just recently checking out Tool Chondra. If you like black metal, but also like, for me, a bit more interesting in a lot of ways, um, check out the album Hail the Abyss. And as always, you can check out all of the episodes of the How Songs Are Made podcast on howsongsaremadepodcast.com. Uh, all of the previous episodes available as audio episodes if you want to see the video versions of all of these you can uh, check out the how songs are made podcast youtube channel where they're all going to be maybe you're watching this right here right now and you can look into my eyes i stream these live all of these interviews um, they're on the channel now. It used to be on my YouTube channel. Um, now they're all going to be on the dedicated How Songs Are Made podcast channel. So go ahead and subscribe there if you like. As I said in the beginning, this episode is sponsored by my songwriting course, which is called Complete Rock and Metal Songwriting. If you want to learn more about how to write songs in the metal and rock genre or and how to... Uh, express yourself through the tools of songwriting then head over to howsongsaremade.com or check the link in the description of this video and um i'm also curious to hear from you about who you think i should be interviewing on these podcasts next i um i'm actually in a pretty good position where i'm at to be able to interview people that i want to talk to and um having access to access to artists is um is pretty great um and i think if you suggest something it's pretty possible that i might actually be able to do it so if you want to do that you can leave a comment on um on the videos and you can also check out the uh my discord server and uh there's a suggestion channel in there and uh I'm curious to know what you like, uh, what you think. And also, of course, the How Songs Are Made podcast Instagram, which is like sort of the uh, the epicenter of all of the How Songs Are Made uh, stuff. There's a lot of uh, clips from podcasts that, that are there and will be up there, all the juiciest bits. Um, so thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to follow on all podcast services where you find your podcasts and uh i'll see you real soon thanks see ya <laughs>